This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only. Uh, so we're going to talk about low impact development. We're going to call it LID so we can get through in 15 minutes. But, uh, uh, we're going to tell the story of <coughs> low impact development, kind of where it's at um, through the lens of the city of Mesa. So we should probably just stop reading the news because this is the kind of stuff we run into. Uh, but we're going to talk about how low impact development can help uh, with these kind of urban problems that we're running into. So the project, uh, we interviewed uh, Scott and Jeff and some of their colleagues, uh, the key people that are sort of advocating with at the city. <coughs> we're just, <coughs> excuse me, we're just going to kind of go through the, the five W's, how they did it, focus on a few key things. Um, they have this thing called the LID toolkit that we're going to discuss. Uh, it's one of the techniques they're using to uh, get through some of the barriers uh, for low impact development. So what is low impact development? <coughs> it's basically, our slides got a little messed up here, but <coughs> It's, uh, it's basically get, you know, keep stormwater local as much as possible. So instead of this shuffling, this is the LA River, instead of shuffling it off to the sea, you know, return it to a more natural state. And by that simple principle of keeping water local, uh, you have all these other ancillary benefits that we're going to talk about. There's a residence in Phoenix. He turned the public right away into that um, just through, you know, stormwater management and, you know, Lessening the amount of impervious surfaces, you know, these sorts of principles lead to a much more pleasant environment. So it's, it's a simple principle, but it's actually pretty transformative when you look at uh, what people have been able to do. So <clears throat> why is lid important? Um, traditional, conventional stormwater infrastructure has a lot of problems. Uh, we've created huge amounts of impervious surfaces. <clears throat> when that water shuffles off of an impervious surface, we get flooding, uh, it picks up tons of pollutants, pesticides, oil, all sorts of pollutants that dump into our waterways and uh, washes and so forth. And conventional infrastructure is very expensive. So, you know, that's a, a negative, but it's also a positive for alternative solutions like low impact development. I won't, <coughs> I won't read all of these, but, you know, there's a lot of benefits uh, that can come back or can come from just doing things a little bit differently. Low impact development, a lot of it is low tech, you know, but it is a, an innovative technology in terms of what cities are using, you know, to manage stormwater. Um, so what did we find from Mesa? You know, people are very aware of the problems we have here in the desert. Uh, we're in a drought in the Colorado Basin. You can see the serious drought. Um, we're suffering from a couple decades of what one person called cookie cutter growth. Uh, everything looks the same. Lots of concrete, lots of asphalt, not, lot, not a lot of trees. Um, you know, wood can help us kind of overcome some of these situations. So this is your traditional technology um, adoption graph. Lid is kind of here. It's kind of in the early adoption stage. You know, uh, Jeff and, and Scott and company are trying to leap what they call the chasm, which is how do you get it out of this early adoption stage, get it to some sort of standardized you know, everyone's using it, it's popular, everyone's aware of it. Um, you know, they are a progressive group, as, as one person said, they want to be ahead of the curve, which they are, but they got to leap this chasm. So we're going to discuss you know, how, how, did they, how are they going to do that, how can they do that. So this is Phoenix, just a couple months ago. Uh, we've got climate change effects going on, more variable climate events. Um, so it's good timing uh, for something like low impact development to come along to help with these sorts of things. Here's a Mesa neighborhood. Uh, recent li lawsuit just filed over what happened here. So conventional infrastructure, although it's pretty reliable most of the time, it's not completely reliable. So low impact development can help mitigate uh, you know, the stress on uh, conventional infrastructure because along with these events, if we have to expand the, the infrastructure that's already there, that can be very expensive. So if we can lessen the burden on what's there, uh, low impact development will have a big uh, impact. So some of you have probably heard of a book called Bird on Fire, which called the Phoenix region one of the most unsustainable places in the, in, on the planet. Whether you agree or disagree with that, you know, we sort of have this constellation of problems that we have to deal with. So, um, you know, one of those is the urban heat island effect, which a couple people already mentioned in their projects. The temperature, the night, nighttime temperatures in Phoenix have gone up 11 degrees in 50 extremely dramatic. So 
that's probably one of, he doesn't look too happy, maybe this is one of the reasons. Um, so I'm going to talk about where. Um, LID started in the northeast. Obviously there's a lot of rain, a lot of grass, a lot of turf. And this is Seattle over on the side there. That's an example of low impact development. Um, but in contrast, uh, LID can be implemented anywhere. Um, like Van said, we have major flooding. And actually just yesterday, this worked really well. This was a, um, a project right in front of the Mesa Urban Garden that um, a bunch of us actually worked on. And you can see a curb cut right um, from the street that goes in and then um, this little um, bioswale. So this has been shown to work you know, immediately and um, has these, these lasting benefits. Um, so an example that, um, a good example of a local lid project, this is what uh, Mesa is doing in the Fiesta District. So this is Southern Avenue, this is the before picture. You know, it kind of looks sketchy, you don't really want to be here. And then uh, after, uh, it's welcoming, you know, it's beautiful and it also helps um, Reduce, storm, reduce flooding and um, stormwater management. So the who, this is kind of a, a crazy slide for a reason. Basically, who are the players in this? Who, who should care about LID? And everyone. So basically, anyone who drinks water or you know, gets rained on. So you don't wanna, <laughs> you don't wanna um, have dirty stormwater and then you don't want flooding. So basically the players are the public um, who want clean water, public departments, the engineering departments who are uh, making these plans, the transportation department who are, um, who are maintaining the, um, the right-of-ways and, and these projects. Um, in addition, the private developers. It's not, even, it's not only just for Mesa or um, Tempe, but it's people who are you know, building these complexes and really just want to meet minimum code. And you know, that's great and all, but we want to really go a bit above and beyond, and that's what Mesa's trying to do. Um, and so, <clears throat> It's, this is, sounds great, sounds like we can you know, go ahead and go for it, but there are major barriers. And um, we found, we f a lot of research um, kind of mirrored the barriers that we heard from the, our interviews. So basically, for example, um, risk, career risk is a big one. Uh, working in, a, in a, um, a government department, you know, there are career risks. You don't want to put your neck out on the line there and then have it shot down or have you know, big deficits in money because of something. So spreading the risk is something that, um, a solution that can be helpful. And then in addition, um, a technical issue, so permeable pavement. That's a really exciting technology that is not getting implemented because it has you know, these, um, these misguided views on maintenance. There have been studies that show how effective it is, but here in the desert, you know, you think, oh, she's gonna get clogged, she's gonna get clogged. But that's not the case. Um, that's not what the research shows. So Mesa, how did they really get there? How are we trying, you know, we want to present this to other cities to say, uh, in the Phoenix area for LID implementation. Um, so there's a core group of people in Mesa who are making the decisions um, that are very progressive and are really excited about this. So the, um, basically, it's, it's, there's been a demographic shift. So there's, I'm, just, I'm gonna say younger people in the area, or in, in the departments, um, that are really excited and, <laughs> you know, they, like they're spreading the risk. They're all, you know, going in on this. So it's, you know, it's. It's community bonding and it's working together. The communication is very impressive. You know, all the departments kind of had the same same views um, and the same issues, and we're working together. Um, so Mesa's doing a really great job. I think it's a it's a good case study for other cities to look at. And so the WIFA, the um, the grant that they got from the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority, um, started this toolkit. So what is a toolkit? We looked at you know we did all this research, and there's a lot of these toolkits or you know guides about how to how to implement LID. So basically, if I'm, I'm a person and I, you know, I wanna create a LID project in my house and I go, okay, I need flow control, that's what that says right here. So um, this is like kind of an interactive document. You say, I click flow control and it brings you up with this curb cut. So it, it, you know, it's specific, you know, what you need and then it gives you examples and then also you know, kind of implications of those examples. So this is a great timing because as Van said, of all these floods um, and then I think <coughs> translating it into an app and a kind of interactive document is really cool. Um, everyone's online these days, and going out in the field. We mentioned, you know, you're you're out in the field, and a developer wants to, you know, remember what he was looking at in the curb cut. So this is a great reference tool. So, you know, synthesizing the research and the interviews we did, we came up with some recommendations. And the first one is uh, share the risk, which uh, we looked at a couple contractual risk sharing schemes, where the risk is sort of spread amongst different teams, design teams, contractors, personnel. And 
this works because you know if that old school engineer feels like he's shouldering all the risk for a certain project, he's he's not going to put his his stamp of approval on it. And so there's some examples of, of how this can be done, uh, and it's actually you know in the contracts of cities, so someone doesn't feel like you know their career is on the line. And there's there's a couple other benefits that you do from the risks uh, of projects get exposed because a lot of times they remain hidden. People don't know what the risks are, and then when they pop up later, uh, certain people get blamed. Um, so it, it makes for a more transparent process. Uh, I mean, we think for conservative cities, like Mesa's a pretty conservative place. It was actually rated the most conservative city in the nation, I think, pretty recently, if I want to study. Um, this will help you know, the parties uh, work together for uh, collective action. Another one is, uh, we heard some information about a green revolving fund. We're not sure if that's still active or if it's on the back burner at Mesa. Um, but basically, you know, you make a fund where, you know, if you install LID lights and you save the city a million dollars, you reinvest that money for future projects, and it, it's a revolving fund. 